All right. Hey, everyone, this is Bram Kanstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode of Bitcoin for Millennials, I'm joined by CJ Konstantinos. He's a nine year Bitcoin veteran and has been stacking and holding Bitcoin since 2014 and even mining Bitcoin since 2016. He believes Bitcoin is commoditized energy, we'll, we'll definitely talk about that, in the form of money, the reserve asset of the internet economy and the most pristine form of collateral in the world. Because of these attributes, he believes that the future of finance will be built about, around Bitcoin. Well, these are a lot of topics to explore and I'm excited to dive in, so welcome, man. Thank you, thanks for having me. Yeah, that's basically my entire Bitcoin thesis right there. <laughs> All right, well, that's a, that's a lot to talk about. I love before we skip to my first question, like commoditized energy, like I use that as well. And I, I love that. And I think it kind of ties in to when people say like, oh, Bitcoin is not backed by anything. Is this the answer to that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it's one of the most stressful things that I'm experiencing right now in the marketplace is that people don't understand the basic concepts of business. I mean, you start a business to make a profit, right? So a lot of people in this zero interest rate policy, it was about getting customers. The bottom line was not as important as the top line because the money was cheap, basically free for the big corporations. So capture as many customers as you can because one day later, we're going to monetize them. Well, that's not really how it works in, a, in a, an economy where rates are where they're supposed to be. And they're still too low for where they need to be right now. But as they correct, what we'll see is that companies become more focused on the bottom line rather than the top line. It's not about customer acquisition. It's about quality of product and profit. And profit drives the whole economic engine. So if you're in business and you have a cost, it should be common sense that you can't offer your product or service for less than the cost, right? Because then you have no profit. You're better off just closing down your business and getting a job because at least you'll make money for your time and energy. But if you run a business that can't run a profit, what are you doing? Well, the bottom line where you determine your cost versus your profit, that is what drives the whole decision-making processes for producers. So this, the, you know, these laws of economics, these are natural laws of economics that apply directly to running a business, and it's no different for Bitcoin. You know, the cost to produce a Bitcoin, if I'm mining Bitcoin, and it costs me $20,000 to mine a Bitcoin or earn a Bitcoin, I'm not going to sell it to you for less than 20. I can't. The laws of business say that if I sell that for less than 20,000, I'm going to go out of business. It's a bad right? business. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, right. the natural laws of economics and the business cycle are what back Bitcoin as commoditized energy in the form of money. That's absolutely the answer to people mm -hmm. who say it's not backed by anything. And to maybe try to simplify that, like, is that I, I once I tried this in a tweet, right? Like anything people create, anything, a service, a product, a building, a car or whatever, even, um, you know, uh, jobs that uh, require thinking, you know, you expend a certain amount of energy or you utilize that in a certain way. Right. And as you mentioned, like the concept of a business is that you by putting in value, you create value. And what someone pays for you, pays for that value, basically, or well, you put in energy, you create value, someone else pays with energy as well, or something that represents value, right? And if you run a good business, the thing they pay is more than, than what they get. Exactly. And if it's not, then that is actually the free market price signal telling you, that's the marketplace telling you, hey, yeah the value proposition of your good or service is not good enough. You know, so you're not solving a big enough problem for me. The, in other words, the demand isn't going to be there. So the company can't charge a price that's above the cost. So as yeah. price falls below cost, that's the marketplace's natural signal to the producer that you should redistribute or reallocate your resources and focus on something where profit can be generated. So the lack of profit is how the market signals to producers reallocate, redistribute resources and figure out a better product or service that's going to solve a bigger problem of mine that I'm willing to pay for a price above the cost. Or would you say that's then 
perhaps true capitalism in a sense, right? Like if we both have a bakery and I make better bread than you and no one, you know, even though we have bread, quote unquote, but no one goes to, to your bakery because your bread doesn't taste good. You're not as good at, in bread making <laughs> as I am. Then I would win naturally. Right. Yeah. So, so then the market Absolutely. requires you to, to shift your, your, your energy expenditure basically. Absolutely. But not only that too. And Satoshi has a quote about this. I, I've tweeted this before. It's one of my more popular threads. But um, I'm not, I can't directly quote him. But basically what he said was that the cost of production of pretty much any commodity or any good or service always tends to gravitate towards its cost of production. And the reason yes. is, is because if we have two breaker, bakeries and I'm making bread and people need bread and then you see, hey, He's making that bread for a dollar and selling it for two dollars. I want to get in on this business. Well, then as you start to make bread, what happens? The supply of bread goes up against a fixed demand or maybe a slowly rising demand with population. Yeah, unless you invent a cronut or, a, you know, some crazy <laughs> yeah. new bread type. Sorry. Absolutely. But, yeah. So as the supply of bread goes up, the price comes down. Well, where does it come down to? It trends down towards its cost of production. And this, this natural law of economics, it governs Bitcoin as well uh, as business. And if we follow the bread example, but if the price goes down, right, some people will say, well, I'm going to quit my bakery because, you know, I cannot make enough money anymore. The demand for bread stays the same. There are then less bakeries and then the price will slowly go up again, right? Absolutely. And, and the amazing part with Bitcoin is where the difficulty adjustment comes in, right? Because if somebody is making that bread and the, the cost is, is too high and they can't profit yeah. and they stop making the bread, well, it doesn't become cheaper for anybody else who's making the bread to make the bread. What happens is the difficulty decreases and as the difficulty decreases, it becomes cheaper to earn a Bitcoin through mining. So it's kind of like a self-sustaining protective mechanism that we don't see in any other good service or commodity in the world. The difficulty adjustment is truly the technological upgrade to Bitcoin as a commodity that makes it the best form of money and the least risky commodity to produce in the world. And how could we translate that into a word people would understand? Like, is, is that like, um, I almost, I want to use the word like market maker, but that's not the word. Like, it's, it's kind of like this automated incentivizer for people to keep contributing to let's keep with the let's stay with the example right like uh, uh baking breads in that in this example yeah so the way i say it is price drives hash rate hash rate drives difficulty and difficulty drives cost of production so as the hash rate goes up and blocks are being added to Bitcoin at a faster than 10 minute pace. The difficulty just Which is says, the goal. wait a yeah. second. It's my job to make sure that blocks get added at 10 minute intervals. So yeah. if it's if the pace is too fast and there's more hash rate than there was in the previous epoch, then the difficulty will increase and it will target a difficulty that it believes will allow the existing amount of hash rate to produce a block every 10 minutes. So as that difficulty goes up, it increases the cost uh, for miners to earn that Bitcoin, which that is the definition of store of value, right? Store of value is higher lows. Everybody gets really excited about the peaks. Oh, 1,000, 20,000, yeah. 70,000. Uh, when you're in Bitcoin for long enough, you don't care about the peaks anymore. You care about the bottoms. Where are those bottoms going? And that uh, is what Bitcoin does best. That's what it was designed to do. That's the technological innovation, the difficulty adjustment and a digital commodity where the cost of production, even if miners are unprofitable and they have to turn off their machines, the difficulty will adjust downwards and it, then they become more profitable. So sticking with that same thing, imagine you were making bread, but then all of a sudden, because other people stopped making bread, it became cheaper for you to make bread. So that increases your profits. It incentivizes you to create more. Of course, yeah. we don't see that in the real world. It's only uh, something that's built into Bitcoin. That's To me, that's the real genius um, of the commoditized energy. 
because it is it, it reduces the risk of competition, right? In every other aspect of the economy, if a business starts and starts making profit, competition is going to pop up. Look at streaming services, for instance, right? Netflix came up and now, boom, everybody has a streaming service. Well, with Bitcoin, the more and more streaming services or bakeries that pop up, the more expensive it becomes to offer that service to the marketplace. Uh, and that mechanism is what protects Bitcoin's true, uh, let's call it fair value. Um, yeah. Or maybe maybe to, to talk in like classic terms of like marketing, it's like uh, an automated barrier to entry in a sense or barrier yeah. to, to keep participating, perhaps. Yep. Yeah. I, and and um, that's a self-sustaining mechanism. So that's for Bitcoin. That's amazing because, you know, I like to compare. I'll, we'll move off bread and, and streaming services. Let's move the gold, right? Because yeah. gold is the, the direct comparison. You know, if the price of gold goes below, it's all in sustaining costs. And and let me try to simplify this down. If it goes below the cost of production, right? Yeah. If it goes below the point at which it costs the miner Taking the it out of the ground, <laughs> exactly. literally, yes. Then they have to stop mining because they can't mine at a loss. Yeah. And then as they stop mining, we, it's the same economics. Supply goes down against the consistent demand, price goes up. Same thing happens with Bitcoin, except... Bitcoin is in the process of its moving through that S curve adoption, right? We're still at the bottom of the S. We're not we haven't made that big parabolic move yet where where Bitcoin gets full scale adoption. So at, at at this point in time, I think what's so interesting for millennials to understand, I mean, if you can take away from this interview one thing, understand this. We are at the point in Bitcoin price discovery where we're at the bottom of the S curve. When you're at the bottom People of the S-curve. People are figuring S out what this is, basically. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yes. When you're there, that's your point of a maximum opportunity because the price is going to be relative to the commodity value. So that's why I call it the commodity, um, the com commoditized energy in the form of money. Because right now, the, the price of Bitcoin is really... It gra like Satoshi said, it gravitates towards its cost of generating. But in the future, after we have that huge S-curve adoption move to the top, it's going to be about the monetary value of Bitcoin. And that yeah. goes back to your last uh, interview of people that watch it with Peter, where he talks about all the different values in the world that Bitcoin is going to have to represent, whether it's accounting and purchasing power, store about all of the all of these different forms of uses that's the monetary value of Bitcoin. You, you almost can't even put a dollar number on it because it, it's so vast, because it's, it's literally all the economic energy in the world divided by 21 million. That's the monetary value of Bitcoin. But right now, you have the chance to buy Bitcoin for its commodity value. And in all honesty, nobody yeah. knows when that transition is going to take place. Yeah. So I, the I fact love this is, explanation. is now's the time to get in as a millennial. Now's the time to establish your position and forget about everything else. Focus on Bitcoin. It is the only decentralized network. And if, you, if you're able to do that, Bitcoin will empower you through its design by putting in those higher lows. And you'll be able to preserve and even grow your purchasing power through time. All right, we got straight into the deep end. The deep Sorry. end. Sorry, yeah, I, no, no, know. no. I love it. I love it. I love it. You know, like one of my um, w one of my goals also with this podcast is, um, like, you you use a lot of terms, and I understand all of them. You know, and I'm, I I love that we went with the bread analogy because I'm also trying to like find ways where we can you know explain, simplify a bit more. You know, like kind of. I want to say like create these little threads that different people could pull on, you know, like whatever, whatever triggers them, you know, or, or maybe hooks them into, you know, learning, learning about Bitcoin more. But I love, uh, I love what you said. And also maybe to add to that, like now Bitcoin, I actually had a, like a, a, a Twitter conversation about this today. Like now, you know, Bitcoin is um, priced in dollars. And later, like, as you mentioned, like, and I think this is still the thesis, right? At least for me, like Bitcoin is either going to be nothing or it's going to be everything. Like I don't, I don't, I don't see a, a middle in there. Like this is this is just my my thought. So, if it goes to everything, then 
it will also turn around, right? Like Bitcoin will not be priced in dollars, but everything will be priced in Bitcoin. Not in a supermarket sense of way, but in a value sen sense of way. And I, th I think we'll get to that, you know, what is the difference between um, price and value and money and currency and, and, and yeah, those things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think a, a great way to kind of simplify this down is getting into money versus currency. Yeah. Right. Because Bitcoin is the Bitcoin is money. But what we're what we call money today is not really money. It's currency. And that's that's the real problem. So we've gone through this process of of I guess I want to call it evolution, but I guess it's more like devolution because we've gone backwards. You know, mm -hmm. we had real money in the form of, a, of gold and then banks would take that gold and ha and hold it on their balance sheet as an asset. And then they would issue paper, and that paper note would be a claim for the gold that they held. So yes. that's a you know that's what I would call a paper commodity money because it's paper, but it still derived its value from the underlying asset, which was gold, which is a commodity. Yeah. The the real trick that happened here, and we're not taught about this in school. You know, so millennials, we're not going to hear about this going through. Uh, K through 12, or even in secondary education, right? Uh, you're just not going to hear it. You're not going to be taught this. But there is a difference between money and currency. And the main number one difference is store of value, right? So the dollar is a fantastic currency. It's a fantastic medium of exchange. Um, and some could argue actually that the existence of the dollar um, strengthens Bitcoin, right? Because as the, the abuse of the dollar continues to rise, with the U.S. government spending, in the last 30 days, they spent $9.88 billion per day, right? And at the same time, the Federal Reserve, through their quantitative tightening, destroyed about $200 million uh, uh, per day. So on a net-net basis, there's about $9.6 billion that the government is spending into circulation. Well, that is the definition of inflation because you're increasing the amount of circulating currency units and they can do that based on the vote based on the budget right they take a vote they pass the budget they borrow the money and then they spend it into circulation that is our problem here today you hear a lot of people a lot of economists talk about the 1970s like we have 1970s problems our problems are more like the 1940s because in the 70s a lot of that inflation took place by the banks uh lending so people came to the banks to borrow money, and they happily lent money. Well, the amount of money they lent increased the amount of circulating credit units, uh, and that created inflation. Well, when Vockler raised interest rates all the way up to 20%, there wasn't a large debt. There wasn't a big government deficit, uh, and the amount of people who wanted to borrow went way down. And that's not the scenario that we see today. So what, what's happening today where everybody's waiting to see um, – recessionary prices and even the economy itself is slowing down but the prices keep going up they call that stagflation how is this happening well we can look back to the 1940s to explain this instead of the 70s because in the 40s we had inflation as well but the inflation came from government spending government spending that's the two these are the two biggest ways uh to increase the dollar supply because you know a lot of people they don't understand that there are actually four different types of currency. So of course you have fiat cash currency, but the, there's only about $5 trillion of, of cash that's circulating right now. Um, and that's as of last quarter, the new numbers, you know, it changes every quarter. But then you have um, central bank reserves are another form of the dollar, bank deposits and treasuries. So fiat bank deposits, central bank reserves and treasuries. Those are four different types of dollars. I bet you most millennials watching this podcast, when they think of dollar, they only think of one thing or maybe two. They think of cash or they think of a bank deposit, but they're not yeah. thinking of central bank reserves and they're not thinking of treasuries. But these two are also a form of the dollar. And if any one of those forms of the dollar uh, expands, its supply is expanded by government vote or by bank lending, that right there is inflation. Well, of course, as you know, with Bitcoin, nobody can expand the supply. There's 21 million coins, and there will never be any more. That fact, uh, coupled with the difficulty adjustment, is what creates 
uh, this magical synopsis, this magical synchronicity between the laws of economics um, and then the real world consequences of the actions of our government. And as they continue to increase all four of those forms of the dollar and create inflation, uh, Bitcoin is here to protect our value. It's savings technology. And if our generation can understand that, uh, then we can easily opt out. It reminds me of that meme where the politician is on a plank over a cliff and all the people yeah, and are the rest standing. of the people are holding him up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, hey, instead of saving dollars and holding this guy up, take your dollars that you earn at work, spend them at the store for what you need. But when you have something left over, you know what to do with it. You can't save currency. You can save money. Well, the best form of money by far is Bitcoin. So let's just opt out peacefully. We don't have to crush the Federal Reserve and fight the government. Let them do what they're going to do because Bitcoin will protect you through the laws of economics. Take your savings and save it in Bitcoin. Don't fall for the idea that higher interest rates yeah. means a stronger dollar. Yeah. Um, if you don't yeah. mind, I can kind of go off into a tangent on that. That's one of that's a hot topic right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's take a little break. Like also, what I wanted to say, and, and and I think you illustrate that with that meme as well, right? Like it's also teaching and and hopefully demonstrating to people that you can also be more sovereign when when you actually have Bitcoin, right? Like the rules of Bitcoin, the the rules of the Bitcoin protocol, as I like to say, you know. They're open and transparent, like the whole uh, monetary policy is transparent. It can be audited 24-7, 365, right? So if you understand and then believe that that it's an asset that you can hold, which keeps its value over space and time, so into the, into the future, that once you hold it, you are fully sovereign, like you are not... Um, dependent on whoever decides whatever right changing a policy pushing a button printing money you know whatever like you you basically opt out of that as you mentioned and i also fully agree like this is not like an anti-bank uh, anti or anti-dollar type of um <clears throat> well some some people see it like i don't really see it like that it's more like okay you have a system system a which is provably <laughs> not so good. And you have a system B, which is provably way more superior, P plus even more, plus more transparent than, well, anything. Like you can list a lot of things, right? And so I think it's just a fair choice for people, right? Like once you know, um, and just uh, like I recorded another podcast today uh, with Mark. And he also said like, once you know that this is there, you cannot hide anymore, right? Like you have to choose. Like once you know that this is there and you decide not to study it, totally fine. But if you also decide not to study the other thing, you know, the flawed system basically, yeah, then you cannot cry when when something happens there, right? Like there is no, there's no free pass. There's no free pass in life basically, right? So you, yeah. you either <clears throat> study it or not, both the choice, both fine, like no judgment, but but there is going to be some sort of consequence, whatever it is that you actually have to live with, right? And I think now, and also like one of the goals with this podcast is to like show people like, this is the other thing. This is the other thing as a real like antagonist to mm -hmm. to the thing that already exists that you probably also don't understand, right? Like that's, that's one of my motivations. Basically, like uh, I was participating in this system until I understood that, uh, you know, money in the bank is not yours. And that was for me the threat to think like, okay, uh, I'm participating in a system that I have no clue about. I, I, I should do some research, right? Well, that, that was kind of like one of the things that led me to Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, I think that I agree. actually but leads perfectly <clears throat> into part of my, the last part of my thesis which is Bitcoin is the most pristine form of collateral in the world. Because you know where that saying comes, be your own bank. Mm -hmm. Well, what, like you said, in your, what you, when you were talking, you said they can't change anything about it. Well, what's the one thing that people do these days? They just sit around waiting for the Federal Reserve Board of Governors to decide the price of money, right? To decide what the interest rate is going to be. It's not a free market process. It's mm -hmm. a stated rate. Well, Bitcoin, as the reserve asset of the internet economy, is the only money in the world 
where the economy doesn't try to name the price of their money. Every other economy in the world has a central yeah, just bank is. that tries to tell you what the price of that money is. Bitcoin is a free market price of money. And that that is where the rest of the marketplace is missing this right now. Mm -hmm. um, when I say that the future of finance is going to be built around Bitcoin and the, the Bitcoin equity, the value of Bitcoin, what I mean is that true free market principles are going to outcompete and outlast these fixed fake market principles that we see in the fiat system where they can state rates. I mean, um, it's this simple. The, the interest rate sh should be based on the supply of money and the demand for loans. It's funny because maybe like two years ago, you could go into DeFi uh, and you could you know wrap your Bitcoin and you could start earning on your Bitcoin. And people were like, wow, this is fantastic. Because in the traditional system, we were still at zero interest rate Print, you know, so there's like zero interest rate policy in the traditional system that I can't earn anything there. You know, my bank is giving me 0.01%. But, you know, if I buy some Bitcoin and I wrap it and I put it in one of these protocols, I can start to earn three, four, five percent. And that was like groundbreaking. And now here we are during a bear market and the traditional interest rates are higher than the DeFi interest rates. So it's like, well, now you can go borrow against your Bitcoin for two or three percent. Two years ago, it was costing you eight to twelve percent. Mm -hmm. So you know the fact that interest rates are allowed to move based on the supply of money and the demand on loans, uh, that free market mechanism will out compete and out uh, perform versus the the fiat system where they the the governor of the central bank is saying this is what the rate should be based on. Uh, our analysis and our data and you know forget about going into whether the data they have is correct or not but it's not the marketplace signal no, it's like more we talked the, about it's earlier. more the principle right like it's the principle yeah. um, and i love that bitcoin is written with memes obviously but this is one of them it's like follow do you want to follow the rulers or do you want to follow the rules that's right. right and 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 bitcoin is the rules in this uh in in this example right like it's just a thing it's just there and anyone who wishes to participate can decide on you know the the price of it or the value of it but it whatever you think of it it just keeps going right, right. and 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 so i think that's and i find that interesting actually like you can go into a deep end and you know get research or this was like this in 1990 or 60 or you know whatever but I, I love that Bitcoin is so beautiful in a sense that you can really drill it down to certain types of principles, right? Like uh, system A does things in this way, which, okay, it is there, but it doesn't, it's not really logical. And then you see like how Bitcoin works. Like for example, it's auditable to, to like I said, 24 seven, 365, the federal reserve or any central bank is not. Yes. So just that, right? Like, like just that, I, I would love to like share more, right? Because I think if you're like an interested, somewhat intelligent, rational person, then that should not make sense, right? Like <laughs> if you, and, and I say this a lot, but if you have to say you're transparent or honest or fair and you cannot show it, then you're not, right? Like also right. that's that's another one, right? It's just basic principles in some sense, but I find it very logical. but. Well, I don't know how your orange pilling goes, but sometimes it's actually <laughs> difficult to, you know, trigger people in that way. But let's go back. Like, I still wanted to ask my first question, but it's funny, oh. like how we, how we do. No, no, no. We're all good. Like, this is Sorry. fun. Um, no, but as you mentioned, you're a millennial as well. And I think it's fun. Like, uh, you're, you're obviously really into this, you know, and you share a lot about it. Like, but why, even for me, and, and it, it's a lot, right? Like why, why is financial literacy so important, especially for millennials, right? Like for our, our generation, like, you know, you barely scratched the surface in what you just mentioned, right? And, and I think that's the point of this question. Like why, why is it so important? Is it, is it because it's so opaque or we don't learn about it? Like what's your, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, what comes to mind is a Bible verse that where it says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge and the translation there really is um because we don't understand these things and because we're not being taught these things other people who understand these things and are in control and in power are yes. using it against us to destroy yes. us 
because inflation really is uh, taxation without representation, right? I mean, if you think about this, you know, in other words, why do we pay taxes? Well, the, the reason that we pay taxes without representation, is so that, you mean this is property tax or this is yeah any right, like, any type of tax. Why do we pay taxes yeah. to the government? And the whole idea is that you know if you think of the government in in terms of a corporation, which it really is, then you you need money, right? Just like a business. If a business doesn't have profit, it disappears. Well, if the government doesn't have profit, it disappears. So the entire system itself is based off of those tax revenues. So, you know, we go to work and we get a paycheck and you get a W-2 um, and the government, you know, they offer their pension, services. Right? W-2 is pension. Uh, uh, earned income. earned So like a salary. Yeah. Okay. And you pay these taxes to the government and the government is supposed to take the tax and then spend it to survive. That's where it gets its income from that. But now we're at the point where the rules are so um, twisted, uh, and the reason that it's gotten like that is because people in my generation and even the generation above us, they kind of ignored these things. These things went on autopilot, and as Satoshi said, there was too much trust in the system, and we, you know, that trust afforded them the opportunity to take advantage of people who didn't understand uh, yeah. everything that's going on in finance right now, and I think that you know what's happening in interest it's because right now. it just worked right and we didn't have well at right. least it like just worked. It, it, and look, at least in the western countries it's yeah. just there it worked that's also why i want to focus on millennials like we grew up in the best time ever like the easiest time of anyone who's ever lived basically oh yeah you know like i even the generation after us has it worse i think oh, yeah. right so we we had like the most prime childhood growing up yeah, there was I money, think we got like prime no time. problem, nothing. Yeah, I definitely think we got prime time because where we're going from here, see, everybody's waiting for lower prices. But what's going to happen is the lower prices aren't going to come. And we know that because that's what stagflation is. The definition of stagflation is the prices are going up and the economy is shrinking. It's going down. And that's what we've been seeing now for multiple quarters, even here in the United States and pretty much uh, even though the United States is not a big producer, the way the United States goes, the rest of the world tends to go. That's why they call the dollar the, the cleanest, dirty shirt in the laundry, right? Because we kind of lead the way. Well, yeah. our economy is going down, yet prices are still going up. The problem with this is that we come back to those natural laws of economics. And the People natural laws producing. of economics, yeah, when the supply goes down, when the economy goes down, the prices should come down. And that's a good thing because eventually the prices come down far enough to where people can start to participate again. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't go to dinner with it for three people and pay $90. But now I can go to dinner for three people and pay $50. I can afford that. Let's go to dinner. Right. Yeah. So prices come down it, and it, it creates a natural floor, a natural place for the economy to rebound and restart. But now as everybody is sitting on the sidelines in cash, by the way, I've never seen it like this. Uh, five point six trillion dollars in the United States alone, sitting on the sidelines, um, uh, in treasuries, nonetheless, waiting for lower prices. Well, as someone who's been in Bitcoin for nine years, the psychology of the market cycle, I can testify to its truth. Right? When I go to the grocery store and I'm checking out, and the guy asks me, "Hey, have you heard of Bitcoin before?" I'm like, "Oh man." You know, the guy who's bagging my groceries is asking me about Bitcoin. I should probably sell some Bitcoin here, right? Because we're, yeah. we've got to be at a top or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I, but when I go to the bear market and I wear like a Bitcoin shirt, I get dirty looks. I'm like, all right, this means I should be buying more Bitcoin because people think I'm stupid for wearing a Bitcoin shirt. You know, it's the opposite of what the mainstream sentiment typically turns out to, to be the reward from the market. You know, in other words, the marketplace rewards the few and punishes the many. Well, right now, the few are holding Bitcoin and the many are holding dollars. And they, the scary part is um, that these people are holding dollars not because they think that it's going to benefit them for lower prices in the future. They think at some point in time in the future, it's going to be like March 2020. Prices are going to drop down really quick, really low. And if you have money on the sidelines and you're not afraid, you're going to get all these good deals. And then just a couple months later, prices are going to be right back up to where they were and even beyond. 
I mean, that that concept, that that ideology, that strategy is actually has the power of over five point six trillion dollars. That's that's an amazing concept to think about because even if only a very small percentage of that sideline cash enters into the Bitcoin marketplace, um, you're going to see, you know, I think the, the Bank of America multiple is like for every one dollar that goes into Bitcoin, the price can go up one hundred and eighteen dollars. Right. So if you have hundreds of billions of dollars coming into Bitcoin, then the the amount of price movement you can get at one point in time because the supply is so limited um, is just it's almost unfathomable uh, to understand. But we're going to continue to see that we're going to continue to see it from companies like MicroStrategy with Michael Saylor. I don't even know why uh, BlackRock is who would buy an ETF. Why would anybody buy a Bitcoin ETF when they can buy a company like MicroStrategy? You get cash flow from the company. You get no management fee. You'll get dividends. Um, it's like MicroStrategy is the best version of an ETF that there can be. So the fact that BlackRock is getting in there, all these other guys are getting in there, it just shows you that people are finally starting to wake up to this. People are finally starting to understand, you know what? If I got $5.6 trillion on the sidelines, it's okay if I have $100 billion in Bitcoin because of where this is going. And that the recognition of that by the biggest players in the industry is a result of demand, right? Because you don't launch an ETF to not profit. You launch the ETF to profit. And mm -hmm. uh, you're only going to profit if there's demand. So we're seeing the demand. The mathematics are sound. Uh, commoditized energy in the form of money. The value is backed and it's protected. Uh, this is the answer for millennials out there who are asking, how do I save? How am I going to buy a house in the future? How, you know, how am I going to... How are my wages and my savings going to outpace prices? The answer is Bitcoin. That's your, that's your solution. The solution to the problem is Bitcoin. And that's what gets me so excited because you know, the value proposition of bread is, well, you're going to be able to eat. Well, eating is important, but sometimes you, know, bread, you don't want bread. You want something else. And the value yeah. proposition of gold is, well, we can, we can store your value. We can protect your value. You know. A hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, an ounce of gold would buy you one really nice suit. Well, even today, one ounce of gold is going to buy you one really nice suit so you can store your value. But with Bitcoin, you're not just getting the store of value characteristics. You're getting the, the, the exponential growth from being at the bottom of the S-curve to the top of the S-curve. Gold is already at the top of its S-curve, so it's going to store that value perfectly. Bitcoin's at the bottom, so it's not just about storing value through the natural laws of economics. It's about growing your value and growing your wealth and purchasing power because of where it is in its process of adoption. So we are not only did we get the best lifestyle growing up as millennials, but we have this very unique opportunity in time that when people look back on it, they say, oh, my gosh, could you imagine if we were alive when Bitcoin was 30,000? So would you I even say that, that, that millennials are actually the perfect adopters of Bitcoin? Yeah. Absolutely. Right? We are hmm. – legends will be made. You know, I joke with my wife all the time that in our citadel, there will be a picture of us next to each other. <laughs> like that farmer and his wife, right? We're like, yeah, yeah, oh, gonna, Grandpa I'm CJ, man, he was that. buying bitcoins back when they were $200. Yeah, the le like that meme, you know, what did you yeah. do when uh, BlackRock got yeah. an ETF? I, bu I bought before them a legend. <laughs> Effing yeah, legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So – Oh man, I love how much you love this. But I also realized that, you know, it's a lot. So I'm trying to think like, I wrote down some questions for you also. Um, I think if I ask you, can you explain the concept of money to me like I'm five? Maybe that's too much. But like, what is the diff what, what is like value? What is money? And what is currency? Maybe yeah, that's so, even a bigger question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm so bad at this because I just go off on tangents. But I, the the core I'll concept, steer you. I'll steer you. <laughs> yeah, the the core concept of money versus currency is that money is a store of value, and and currency is is not a store of value. And the reason is it goes back to what you originally said. And store of value is I can versus rulers. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. But like store of value is when I put in value for a job or a venture someone pays me value in money that they also earned by giving value right that's the concept yeah, so right? if you think of it in terms of time and energy that might even be yes. a better yes. idea 
Because yes. let's say you're, you're going to work and you're working a 40-hour work week. Well, a lot of people understand that, wait a second, I'm working 40 hours, but after I account for taxes, it's like I only worked 30 hours. Man, that's, you know, that's not fair, right? Because everybody thinks about that. Everybody understands that, especially if you're paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. You know, I remember when I first came out of school, I was paycheck to paycheck, and I was thinking, man, I'm not buying that watch. That watch is, a, is three days worth of work. So hell no, I'm not buying that watch. Right? Yeah. And, you, and you, think in, you think of things in terms of yeah. hours, like how many hours do I have to work to earn this? Well, if you think of money and currency uh, the same way as in time and energy, well, you're, you're doing the 40-hour work week. After taxes, you're down to 32 hours. Well, if you keep the value of your 32 hours of time and energy in currency, it's going to slowly leak. It's like you're keeping it in a bag that has a hole in it. Which and, is dollar, and euro, et cetera, even right? If, yeah, like any of the, those, yeah. any paper currency that's issued by a government and backed by the tax receipts that the government receives, that kind of currency is, is um, being abused because its supply is being continuously expanded. And the, yeah. the expansion of that supply in currency, see, money, can't, you can't expand. If you want to expand the amount of gold, you have to go spend time and energy to pull it out of the ground. So that protects the amount of gold that can be pulled out of ground. That protects the amount of supply that can come to the market. With Bitcoin, yeah. it's an absolute finite supply. So there, you can't just pull out more because you want, you want to or you spend more money. And then if you spend more money and you get the hash rate, then the difficulty adjustment kicks in. And two weeks after you invested all that money to, to produce more of it, now you're right back at a neutral level. So Bitcoin so basically is like, also what you say is that money and currency got conflated. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. People think they're using money, but they're really using currency. But this since 1971, uh, we have been in a, in a currency experiment because up until that time, the dollar was redeemable for gold. So it was a commodity money. It wasn't a, a, a paper currency. Yeah. But for the last 50 something years, we've been in a paper currency experiment. And that experiment is, is that coming also to the an difference. End. Is money backed by something and currency is, I want to say, conceptualized or created in a sense? Is, is that more like a paper, uh, not yeah, so without going but like into a paper the... concept instead of actually representing something of value? Yeah, I think the, be the best and easiest way to think about it is paper currency is backed by taxes. Because yeah. that's that's the really what's the backed government. Up, the income of the government. So the fact that the government is legally allowed to tax its people, that is what backs paper currency. Because ultimately, paper currency, just like that that commodity paper money, it derived its value from the underlying asset, which was gold. Well, the underlying asset here is government treasury. It's government debt. So yeah. you see, on the banking balance sheet, it's a the asset is government debt a treasury and then the liability is the actual currency so the currency derives its value from the treasury but the treasury derives its value from tax receipts so yep. the revenue of the government is really what backs the paper currency and that should be alarming people because as the economy is slowing down the revenue of the government is going to go down but at the same time most governments in the entire world, they aren't slowing down the expansion of their currency supply. They're speeding up the expansion of their currency supply at the same time that their tax revenue is going down. So yeah. on a personal level, imagine you were making $50,000 a year and now your boss comes to you and says, listen, I'm going to have to let you go. And you go, please, I'll, I'll take a pay cut, but I got to stay here. I love this job. I don't want to go elsewhere. I know I'm making good money here. Even if you bring it down to forty thousand dollars, I'll stay here for you. Well, taking that pay cut um, means that you're going to make changes in your lifestyle because you're not going to be able to afford some things or another. Well, the government is making that decision for you, and it's and it's done through inflation. So as they continue to expand expand that currency supply, and you continue yeah. to trade your time and energy, they actually dilute your time and energy. They take away the value of your time and energy through issuing more and more treasuries. And as they yeah, issue exactly. more and more treasuries, that's what really creates the problem of inflation. And yeah. now they're doing it at a higher interest rate. So and is I know the millennials... Simple, 
is the simple illustration perhaps let's say there's a thousand units of money and i own 10 and tomorrow the government decides there's going to be 2000 amounts of money units of money i still have 10 which means my share of the total units of money became less right percentage wise absolutely so that that devalues that what i have basically absolutely but but in order let's say for a store store to keep up with that they will up the units that make the price for a certain thing uh, let's stick with bread again right so they up the number the price basically which is the number of units you have to pay for the bread right but that will account for a bigger share of my share of my 10 right so because there's more money my more units my units are devalued in a sense but the value of a bread just the bread is the same but the price of it will go up yeah because there is more units of the money which makes me uh, uh it impacts me in a way that i can buy less bread let's keep it with bread but right. like i can buy less right like right. that's basically Absolutely. what happens and yeah. and if somebody got lost in that because that is a very great simplification of of how that process works but let me peel the onion back just one more layer because now what's happening is the grocery store is paying a higher cost to get the bread on their shelf and that's where that it's not just the store saying oh well mm -hmm. we think there's more currency units yeah, in circulation, the whole so we're gonna raise the price no the cost to the grocery store to get the bread on the shelf increases because they have to pay the trucker more and they have to pay this yeah. and da, 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 da. and by the way interest rates are a cost so isn't it funny that they try to fight inflation by raising the price you know let's fight rising prices by rising the price of money <laughs> that doesn't make sense at all if you want to if you want to help alleviate price pressures then what you need to do is you need to reduce a business's cost because if you can reduce the cost for a business they can lower the price yeah. and and higher interest so, rates are a higher cost and the and as that same exact process you said there's more units so i own a smaller percentage of those units and because of the increase of the units the price goes up yes but the additional price pressure comes from the increased cost and that cost gets pushed to the consumer from the producer to the consumer so it's like a double whammy it's not only yeah. the devaluation of the currency through the increase of the supply but then it's also the positive price pressures created by the increased cost through the devaluation of the currency that get pushed to the consumer it's a double whammy and so when we talk about this right and i i think that actually you know if you're into politics or finance or whatever like if or geopolitical stuff like if you're if you're following that right like sometimes I talk also with my friends about it, right? Like, or, or, or this conversation that, that we have together, right? Like, we are kind of uh, arguing why we think something doesn't work, etc. But it is still happening, right? So, are we geniuses? Uh, it, are there things we don't understand? Are the people running this idiots? Or are they geniuses and we are idiots? Like... Do you know what I mean? Like, what, like how, how, how do you view that, right? Like, because, well, if we can come up with this, there's probably even smarter people that can also come up with this, right? Like, why, why is this still happening? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And I think it's because the rulers are referring to a rule set that is to an old game. It's not to this, we're playing a different game, right? It's like we were playing Monopoly and now we're playing Clue and you're trying to play Clue with Monopoly's rules. It doesn't mm. make sense, it doesn't work. So it, tra in a traditional mindset, the, this is what the politicians and the central bankers are thinking. I'm gonna raise in the rate, the interest rate. When I raise the interest rate, that's gonna attract buyers for my currency. When people buy the currency, the value of the currency is gonna go up. When the value of the currency goes up, prices are gonna come down. Well. Look, that's because sound... you need to ask less units for the same thing, right? right? Because the value of the money is higher. Correct. So yeah? that okay. is their thought process. But what they're ignoring is the fact, specifically in the United States, but this is in the EU and all over the world. What these guys are ignoring is the mountains of debt. 
So in the United States, we have 33, we just crossed $33 trillion worth number. of debt. <laughs> yeah. But we also have $200 trillion of unfunded liabilities in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and a few other things. Which so, is, on paper, money that is going to be paid. Yes. We but will, for uh, which it, there is no money. Right? Correct. So an unfunded liability is we promised to make this payment. Yes. But we don't have the money to make this payment. So it's an unfunded liability because we promised to make this payment. We know we're going to vote to make this payment, but we don't yeah. have the money. We don't have the tax money. We're not collecting enough tax money to make this payment. So we have to borrow it in order to make the payment. And what these guys aren't understanding is that when you raise the interest rates – it raises the cost for all the governments to borrow the money. So if you think of it on a personal level, and I gave you an offer and I said, hey, Bram, you want to borrow some money. You want to borrow a million dollars. Okay, no problem. I'll let you borrow that million dollars at 8%. You'd be like, 8%? I'll let you borrow that money at 2%. It's common sense which one you would choose. You'd obviously want to borrow at 2% instead of 8%. Obviously, yeah. Because your costs are lower. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing for the government. When the government is borrowing in order to deficit spend, to fund its, its budget, to spend the money into circulation that they promised that they were going to spend but that they didn't collect in taxes, the extra money that they didn't have, they have to borrow it. Well, when they borrow it, they're borrowing it at 8% instead of 2%. Right? They're borrowing it at the higher rate instead of the lower rate. And when you borrow it at the higher rate, that means over the life of the loan – you're going to have to create more currency units. Well, that's the problem, right? The pro this is what I mean by we're playing a different game. Every single time the financial we've ran into a financial problem in this economy, the Federal Reserve has had to create inflation. Whether it was it, it doesn't matter what happened. The the solution to the problem was let's create inflation. Now the problem is inflation. So you can't fix inflation with more inflation. And that's where they're making these decisions. They're using the old playbook of creating inflation to try to fix the problem. But this time around, the problem is inflation. And you can't fix inflation with more inflation. You can't reduce the amount of currency units in circulation when you're creating more currency units. One more thing I'd like to interject on this point. Because people ask me all the time, okay, CJ, you get it, you get it, but what can we do? I'll tell you how easy it is. That was going to be one of my questions. Yeah, this is how easy it is, guys. <laughs> the government simply spends the money it collects in taxes and not one penny more. That's all you have to do. And, and a matter of fact, in the old days, the government would spend less money than it collected. And that's how you would help bring prices down. Because that what sounds happens, like a great idea. <laughs> right? Collect you the know? money in taxes and then spend less money less. that you collect in taxes. <laughs> and guess what? That piece of money that you didn't spend, you're now taking that out of circulation. That is going into the Treasury General account and it becomes the country's savings. And now the country is saving money and that, country, and that money is taken out of circulation. And then in the future, if something bad happens, you have a, a pile of savings that you can spend into circulation to help stimulate the economy. Man, I have to laugh. Like this is what <laughs> this is what's been told in any like <laughs> bookkeeping 101 or finance yeah. 101, right? Yeah. I mean, but, it's really that simple. So that's funny, right? Like, okay, it's that simple, but they're not doing it. Right. Which which is that also Here's a question. Is that also, you know, we talked about when you have Bitcoin, you're a full sovereign. You are also fully responsible to what happens with that, right? Like it's totally in your circle of control. There's no outsourcing of any responsibility, basically. If um, a society or an economy runs on broken money and we say it's broken because it's not backed by anything, right like what we mentioned before can you say that there's then also like no responsibility or there's no let's say well even feeling of responsibility or like the responsibility is outside of anyone's circle who's participating in the group decision making in in this example you know in america also other other of course fiat countries does that make sense 
to you? Like, is there is yeah. there anything in there? Well, absolutely, because it it changes the incentives. It changes the underlying mm -hmm. incentives of the economy. Here's how I'd like to put it, because you hear a lot of um, Gen Xers. They, they come out and they say, debt is a bad thing. And the reason that they say debt is bad is because when they were in their prime, right, when, when they were entering into their 30s and 40s, when they're making the most money and their wealth multiplies the most, mm -hmm. um, debt was a bad thing. And that's because real interest rates or the amount of return you would get would be positive, right? So if you take the, the interest rate and you subtract the inflation, you get the real rate. And if that real rate is positive, then it makes sense to save money. It doesn't make sense to have debt because debt is a liability. It's, it's a burden to you. It requires more of your time and energy. Uh, so when you take out debt, be careful and don't carry debt because it's, debt is bad. You should only use it in certain situations. Well, this is where the, the game has changed. Those Gen Xers don't understand that today debt is actually an asset. Um, and a, it's an asset for the borrower and a liability for the lender, right? Back in their days, the banks wanted to lend money because they would make money off the debt. Today, the banks lend money and then they sell that loan to pension funds and eat, you know, a whole bunch of yeah. different um, well, to divert the responsibility. <laughs> exactly. Basically. Well, yeah, yeah, to yeah. remove the risk from their book. Well, yes. Because if they write that's a That's what I mean. They, well, you take on the responsibility when you... Correct. When you lend it out, that's... Well, that's what I mean. Exactly. We say the they yeah. say, yeah. we can't be responsible for this, so we'll put this risk on somebody yeah. else. And and so what I'm trying to say is, if, if you want to buy a home, in today's... Um, with the way today things are... It makes sense to borrow money because let's say you let's say you borrow money and you buy your home and your monthly payment is three thousand dollars. Well, think about that in 2019. You you took out your loan. You're paying three thousand dollars a month. Everything is fine. This is within your budget. Within you know, you can afford this. Well, now fast forward from 2019 to 2023. Three thousand dollars is much less in 2023 in terms of purchasing power than it was in. 2019 see so to you it's an asset because you still have a fixed payment all you got to do is pay three thousand dollars a month well the bank or whoever owns the loan now becomes a liability because they're yeah. only getting three thousand dollars a month but that and three thousand is worth much less now and is that you know i i don't have a finance or, or econ background so i'm learning as i go but this is a great example i think so numbers wise you're spending the same amount of units, right? In this case, like the 3,000 a month. And for you as the, the borrower, that's great. But that doesn't take into account the value of that amount of money, which, or maybe the price, but correct me if I'm wrong, that the bank financed it for eventually, right? Because they also got... Uh, the money from somewhere you know with these with the with the rates so for the bank it's more expensive than for the the lender is that correct yeah so a lot of people think the way a bank works is that they actually need a depositor's money to lend but yeah when they you, don't <laughs> yeah they yeah. don't when you when you deposit your money at a bank you are actually lending your money to the bank. So the yeah. bank can go and do whatever they want with it. Now, yes. when somebody borrows money from the bank, this is where we go back to where we were talking about inflation created by the banks. The banks go to their balance sheet and they say, okay, this person owes me a million dollars and here's the million dollars I'm going to get. They create it out of thin air. They create it through inflation. So to them, there's a little bit less of a risk, but it, it should shine a real light and the alarms and bells and whistles can be going off because if the bank can create that money for free and they're still deciding that there's too much responsibility, there's too much risk to keep free money on their book and they'd rather sell that loan off to the marketplace, yeah, that tells you the amount of risk in it. So the when the rate of inflation is greater than the interest rate, then – Real rates are negative, and when real rates are negative, it makes sense to borrow money. That's why the Gen Xers are so confused. In their time, real rates were positive, 
So debt was bad. You didn't want to have any debt. You wanted to pay off your debt as quickly as possible. Today, yeah. it makes sense to carry debt. If you have a 30-year mortgage here in the United States and you have that $3,000 payment, in 10 years, maybe even sooner than that, you might be able to go out to the street and pick up $3,000 off the ground and then walk <laughs> into the bank and make your monthly payment. Yeah. Well, that's great for you. That's and what I meant. Like on the paper, the, on paper, the number, the 3,000 number stays the same, but Correct. the value of that 3,000 is plummeting. being debased, right? And that is the problem for the bank. Right. That, that was what I was trying to illustrate, yes, I think. That is yeah. absolutely correct. And okay. that, that risk, that problem has been yeah. shifted through yeah. multiple securities products back onto the people. And it yeah. goes back to what you originally said. Why don't we understand these things? Why aren't we taught these things? Well, because if yeah. we were, we wouldn't be buying debt when it was 100%. a liability yeah, instead yeah. of an asset. So let's tie it back to Bitcoin and transparency, etc. right? Like I think you, you illustrated it a bit like these and these security uh, products and yada, yada, yada. Like we don't, even know, we don't even know all the things that are out there, right? But the fact that it's obscured by, a, a, you know, and abstracted by multiple layers, basically, and also even within finance professionals, right? Like someone at a pension fund is buying this. Um, uh, I don't know. Is that what you call a subprime mortgage? No, that's not a subprime mortgage. That that is what the the the, the asset value is. But like a mortgage that's deemed too risky of the bank is being taken over by another finance professional who works at a pension fund, and well, multiple layers and all these things. My point is, it's very obscure and vague, right? Absolutely. And very hard to trace as well until it potentially blows up and then you know when you pick up the pieces you'll see who who had what and 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 why they blew up right if we put that against bitcoin which is again 24 7 365 auditable everything is transparent you can see all the transactions you can see which account has what and all these things how can i i you mentioned to me before you said bitcoin as a me is a means to accomplish the American dream and to grow wealth, which is purchasing power in, in the future. It's the solution to the problem that millennials have, which is they are getting paid in what we talked about, a currency versus versus money. How do you how do you take that step? Like why why is Bitcoin that that solution? Yeah. So it's the characteristics of money that make Bitcoin the solution because no government, no agency no financial product can be designed to dilute Bitcoin. There's only 21 million units and there'll never be more. And that fact alone is what allows you to use it as a, as a tool for savings. But in today's world, I know a lot of millennials, you know, my peers, they come and they ask me, well, CJ, are you telling me that I shouldn't buy a three-month U.S. Treasury bond or a six-month bond and earn five percent plus i shouldn't be earning five percent yield right so the idea has transitioned from savings to cash flow like there's just there's been a huge transition in the underlying psyche of the marketplace to where savings is less important than cash flow and when rates are positive that's true but the yield on bitcoin the the, the cash flow the satoshi flow on bitcoin really can be viewed two, two different ways. The first way is that Bitcoin over the last 10 years has a compounded annual growth rate of 80% plus. So let's just call it 80%. So imagine if US treasuries were paying 80%. That has been the compounding annual growth rate of Bitcoin because of the difficulty adjustment and the exponential growth of the network. And because we're at the bottom of the S curve moving to the top through adoption, all of those factors allow Bitcoin's uh, store value property to produce over the last 10 year period, 80% increases in your purchasing power per year over the last 10 years. Whereas right now with US treasuries, you're getting 5% of an, of an increase, but real inflation is probably 10%. So really you get like negative 5%, whereas Bitcoin's giving you 80. That's the first way. The second way is through mining Bitcoin. The difference between the cost of producing a Bitcoin and the price that you can sell on the market price, that's the yield. 
So if it, if it costs me $20,000 to mine a Bitcoin and I can sell it to you today for $26,000, that's a 30% yield. I'm selling it to you for 30% above my all-in cost. That is where you can, you, you can yield. So you can take advantage of Bitcoin through its compounding growth rate, through the adoption cycle, or you can mine Bitcoin and take advantage of the difference between the cost of production and the price that you can sell it for on the marketplace. Those are the two best ways to yield with Bitcoin. And if you're new and you're just starting, obviously you buy it and you use it as savings. But the more and more you get into this and the more and more you study it and start to understand, you know, you're going to go down that path of how can I get involved? You know, let me run a node. Let me start mining. Let me figure out different ways that I can use Bitcoin because Bitcoin empowers us in a whole new set of ways that the quite honestly and frankly the traditional world is not ready to for the full unlocking of of Bitcoin and all that it's going to do uh for for people in the future. And so when when people hear this and they think okay, you got me, I'm interested, they will see all the other cryptocurrencies, oh, right? Yeah. What's what's your like go to explainer why Bitcoin is different and yeah, why so, they should ignore the other stuff? Yeah. So what, what my go to explanation for this is Bitcoin. Let's let's think of these as networks, right? So you have like Facebook and you have Twitter and then you have like Gab and Truth Social and probably a whole bunch of other networks that you never heard before, right? And Facebook is Facebook because of how many users it has. Right? Twitter is Twitter because of how many users it has. And these other companies are lower, less name, no brand because they have a smaller user base, a smaller network. So now let's take a look at like Bitcoin and Ethereum and say Monero. Well, when you look at the Bitcoin network, Bitcoin's network is like an ocean. And Ethereum's network is like a lake like a small lake. <laughs> and then Monero's network is like a puddle, right? So when it comes to- And then we to, have a whole bunch of soda cans and uh, like yeah, uh, I mean, shot glasses, right? Yeah, 99%, 99.9% yeah. yeah. <laughs> of, of coins and networks are scams and shit coins, and you should stay as far away from them as you possibly can. And but why the are they there? Why are they, like, I agree, but like, why are they there? Is it like- trying to profit of the invention i would say that is bitcoin right like okay this 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 new invention broke through i'm gonna say it's good but not that good enough and so i have a better solution right like <laughs> is it just so those are so if you hear something described like that it's a scam because there is nothing that can compete with bitcoin the bitcoin network is the only network that is truly decentralized. There is no other network at all that exists that's decentralized besides the internet, really. The internet is it like Bitcoin. the wheel, you know, like the wheel was invented and now like it's not like we have like octagon right. wheels. Yeah. And Once the wheel was invented, like... <laughs> you don't need another wheel. Bitcoin, yeah. Bitcoin is the wheel, but you know what you have to do with the wheel? You have to attach it to a cart because when you attach it to a cart, it makes you that much more productive. And that's where some of these other things start to make sense. For instance, when I participated in the Ethereum ICO, my thought was, oh, Ethereum is gonna be better than Bitcoin. It's gonna, it's, it fixes the problems better. And I'm so disgusted with where the network has gone because the first idea around Ethereum was Bitcoin is money. And now I want to have gas so that I can execute smart contracts for my money. In other words, instead Program of... Program the car with the wheel or right. something. So we got yeah. the wheel. Now let's put the wheel on the cart because the cart is going to allow me to offer all these different products. And serve. If I have the wheel, I can't carry the dirt from point A to point B. Mm. Right? But yeah. if I have the wheel on the cart, now I can offer a product or service that allows me to carry the dirt from point A to point B. So all these other networks that exist to compete with Bitcoin are shit coins and they're scams and you should stay away from them. But there are a few that complement Bitcoin, that only exist because of Bitcoin, that in their greatest dreams 
never compete with Bitcoin. Their goal and desire is not to compete with Bitcoin because they can't be money because they're shit coins. That can, the, the, it's just, there is no other need for another wheel. Bitcoin is the wheel, but you know what? Let's build a cart. And that cart is only going to exist because of the Bitcoin wheel. And yes. that's going to allow us, that's where that, you know, when I say Bitcoin is the reserve asset of the internet economy, this is what I mean. All that wealth that's structured into these treasuries and backed by tax receipts, in the internet economy, all of that wealth is centered in Bitcoin, right? And then you have all these different types of products that are based off of the government's tax receipts. So the government collects tax and they create a product called a treasury. So now you can buy government tax receipts through a treasury. Well, a treasury would never exist if they weren't collecting taxes. Well, if we didn't have Bitcoin, then there'd be no, if, there'd be no need for Ethereum because what, were you gonna, what is Ethereum going to do? Be money? It's, there's an unlimited supply. You can't even audit the supply. of. I can't tell you what the supply of Ethereum is going to be at, at any point in time. With Bitcoin, I can tell you exactly what it's going to be at any point in time. So there's no need for Ethereum without Bitcoin. But with Bitcoin, like I was saying earlier, when DeFi first came out, this is when I really started becoming passionate and starting to understand that Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin is evolving from digital gold to digital collateral, right? Because you had gold and the problem with gold was it's too expensive when, when gold is a collateral um, me and collateral is like, if you want to borrow something from me, then I need something to protect the money that I'm giving to you. I'm not just going to yeah. give it to you based on credit. Protect gonna, the risk of the, of, Right. Of giving that, yeah. So, you know, if you want to build, if you want to borrow a million dollars from me and you give me two million dollars of Bitcoin, I have no concerns that you're borrowing a million dollars from me, you know, because yeah. I have two million dollars worth of collateral. Well, you're going to I'm going to earn interest from the million dollars that you're borrowing from me. So these types of products are, are interesting to me because I think the future of finance is going to be built around Bitcoin equity and people who hold Bitcoin are going to have access to the best interest rates because it is the most pristine form of collateral. If you can post Bitcoin collateral, you're going to get reduced interest rates. If you can post Bitcoin collateral, you're going to be able to earn cash flows because it's the reserve asset of the internet economy. The entire financial structure of the internet economy is going to be backed and supported by Bitcoin equity, a lot like the traditional economy is backed by tax receipts and, and in the form of treasuries. So tr treasuries are the number one reserve collateral where there's the most demand in the future. Bitcoin is going to be the number one reserve collateral with the most demand, but of the internet economy. And what I love about the internet economy and our generation, we understand the internet. Look, no one economy can outcompete the internet economy because it's an aggregate economy of the entire world. So yeah. it doesn't matter uh, who, who tries to compete with it. The game is already over. The the war's already been fought. The battle's already been won. The internet economy is a, is the best economy in the world. It may only be the actually the only growing economy in the world at this point. Every other economy is stagflating. The internet economy continues to grow. That's why if you're on Instagram and all this other stuff, you always see these start your Shopify store, do, 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 you know, e-commerce. You know, mm. why are these things so popular? Because the internet economy, that's where these things are growing. You don't need a storefront anymore where you can sell to your local town. You can sell to the whole world. Well, Bitcoin secures that economy that is selling to the whole world, whereas the treasuries, they secure the local economy. So yeah, being exactly. able to so draw be, that parallel, yeah. it really shows you, you know, what Bitcoin is poised to do. But without, you know, I don't want to say Ethereum because I think Ethereum made the wrong. If I was, if they listened to me, we would have did a thousand to one split on Ethereum. For every one Ethereum you had, you would have got 1,000 more Ethereum. The price of Ethereum would have went from $4,000 down to $4. Much more people would have entered into the marketplace. Remember, we were paying gas prices. If you wanted to do one DeFi transaction, it could cost like five, $600 just to execute yeah. that <laughs> transaction. Well, yeah. it, imagine if it was only 50 cents. All of these other shit coins, all of these other L2s wouldn't even exist if Ethereum had just accepted its role, which was, we're not the wheel, we're not money, right? We're not sound money. Bitcoin yeah. is sound money. We're just role. gas. Yeah. And the reason our gas exists is because these smart contracts are the cart to your wheel that are gonna help us build this future of finance around Bitcoin equity. So mm -hmm. yes, most of it is shit. 
most of it you should stay as far away from you. And if you don't have Bitcoin, you shouldn't have anything else, right? Don't think of it as, oh, I got to take a risk on something else to this try to... This one or that one, yeah. yeah. Or buy Ripple because it's only oh. this and that cent or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Forget All about right. it. Bitcoin All is right. the way. So can you share a common misconception about Bitcoin that you would wish to debunk? This is, this is the moment. <laughs> so... I think, I, yeah, I mean, that goes back to the way we originally started the conversation. The, 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 the thing I hear back most, not only from the millennials, but from all generations, is, oh, Bitcoin's not backed by anything. Well, and, and, and also, Bitcoin is new, right? So let's, let's dive into both of those things. The first thing, let's talk about Bitcoin is just some new idea. Well, that's absolutely false, because if you go back and you look at uh, some of the great minds like Hayek, uh, and others, they were talking about a decentralized... Tesla, Ford, even, all the way back. All the way back. So there there has really been probably about, I would say, over 50, probably close to 50 years of development yeah. on, a, on a private digital yeah. commodity money. So actually that development and research, right, and why I said Ford and Tesla, they conceptualized uh, a money backed by energy. Right? That's right. They, Actually, yeah. like on record, talk. Henry, about yeah, it. Henry Ford. This was back in 1921. He he actually made an announcement that if the government gave him permission to use this factory, he was going to demonstrate how he could create an energy currency, a currency backed by energy. Sound familiar? Uh, and this was in 1921. <laughs> so yeah. you know, this is an old idea. It's just that we now have the technology, not just computer technology, but advancements in mathematics and cryptography uh, and other things that have finally come together and allowed a private digital commodity money that cannot be stopped by the yeah. existing powers that control over money. Um, Hayek said it the best way, that law, language, and money are the three bases that government forms around. Thank God law and language have been able to develop but money has not been allowed to develop. Bitcoin is the first development in money, the first uh, technological evolution in money uh, to change its fundamental structure, right? We went from paper to credit cards. So that was cool because you went from cash to credit cards and Venmo and all these other things. But there was no fundamental change because it was still a currency that derived its value from a treasury, yeah. which derived its Another value from tax Another abstraction, basically. Yeah. Now we have a private, digital, decentralized commodity money that cannot be stopped by any one power, uh, and it's completely decentralized. So the idea that Bitcoin is new, it's risky, it's unsafe, it's dangerous, it hasn't been well thought out. They've been talking about this for over 100 years. It's just now we have the technology and the means to actually bring it to market. And, and thank God we have because it's the, it's the solution to our problems. Now, the second thing is that it's not backed by anything. And this is, goes back to what we were originally talking about. Proof of work equals cost of production equals natural asset value. So what is the natural asset value of Bitcoin? Most people would say, well, it's zero. But that's simply not true because there's a cost to generate a Bitcoin. And yep. the cost to generate a Bitcoin is its natural asset value. So the, so the question becomes... That's also why, maybe to add to that, that's why the miners also are incentivized to find the cheapest energy, right? The value yep. of, of, of that energy. Absolutely. And, well, because the and lower also, their cost, the higher yeah. their profit. And why exactly. are they in business? To profit. Yeah. So yeah. Bitcoin is the only, besides basic human demand for energy, Bitcoin is the only human network that incentivizes energy technology innovation in a sustainable way. Yeah. So the, the, But also because the technology aspect of it actually keeps the energy that's used or that's transformed from wind or solar or hydro or whatever it actually packages that sounds weird but but that's how i see it right it packages it yeah. in a digital way and it stores it in a digital way into space and time right so possibly in into the future and for me that's what that innovation is so that combination of what you said right the actual proof of work you have to do work 
you have to s spend money or use energy yeah, well use energy you capture that energy and that energy stays but it's digital i mean like even when i say this it sounds so weird right like it's very hard it's hard to understand that you could digitalize physical energy but right. but that is basically what's happening right apps well apps look at el salvador el salvador has this all these volcanoes that they can take advantage of that energy but they don't have the infrastructure and they don't have the demand from a population so the reason that they don't have huge energy facilities in el salvador is because number one they never had the infrastructure because they never had the demand so there was no way for them to build all that stuff and then sell the energy but now with bitcoin they can build a small infrastructure to capture that energy and then sell it back to the marketplace. And that's what I think you define a the word commoditized perfectly. Worldwide marketplace. Yeah, a worldwide marketplace with a tremendous base layer of demand, a base layer of demand that's growing faster than any other base layer of demand in the world. As you know, Bitcoin base layer demand is growing faster than the Internet did. Right? The pace of adoption of Bitcoin is actually outpacing the adoption of the internet. So that is leading to the ability for countries to harness power of electricity. And electricity, we live in an electromagnetic universe. Electricity is all around us. We can now capture that electricity, and we're incentivized by Bitcoin to capture it for the cheapest price. Now, that could mean going to a place like El Salvador where you get free energy, but it could also mean... Somewhere down the line, somebody invents or upgrades an existing invention to be more efficient with the energy. So in that manner, Bitcoin is the only sustainable uh, incentivized network in the world that is driving energy technology innovation. And yeah. I have to just add in there because you said wind and solar. I am not a fan of wind and solar. I think that they're it's just not proportional. Well, methane is my uh, primary interest, I yeah. think. So for Bitcoin miners, I think where our focus really is, is number one, it's nuclear. Number two, it's hydro. Uh, number three, it's grid stabilization. And then number four is waste. So mm -hmm. if we can focus on those four areas with Bitcoin mining, we're going to actually produce much more positive outcomes in the world than if we attach ourselves to this green energy, solar, wind Yes, using Bitcoin to supplement the cost of solar and wind makes it more affordable. But the real thing is not green piece, it's orange piece. Orange piece is let's supplement nuclear, hydro, grid balancing, and waste. And those will bring real benefits to our society versus uh, you know supporting a make-believe narrative. But those reasons are, are created through the natural laws of economics, which start with lowering my cost so that I can profit more. And that it, the lower cost is the incentive to innovate different energy yes. technologies. And there is yes. nothing else in the world doing that. Yes, I agree. I once replied to, this is a, maybe I'm going off track, but to Jason Lowry on Twitter, who has a thesis about that um, countries are going to like there will always be war there will always be a power struggle right but instead of using kinetic force or shooting guns and shooting or like dropping bombs they're gonna have hash wars basically computer power wars and i once replied to him and said okay so if i follow your thought and there's always wars there's always power projection and um we're going to fight wars with computer power. Uh, and, and so his thesis is that's underlined with Bitcoin computing power, basically. I asked him, so does that mean that because miners are incentivized, you know, the people who create hash power are incentivized to look for the cheapest energy possible, that will eventually uh, result in new innovations as you just mentioned right so then we're going to save the world by having war with each other <laughs> which is something that we cannot um uh, cannot not have because there is always a power struggle there's always war and then he agreed with me and then i was like oh that's interesting i think i get i get where you're going but i i thought that was really yeah, a bit mind blowing to be honest, right? Like, like that you can take 
that what is bad about humanity in a sense, that power projection, that war, and then through a certain type of technology that incentivizes you to innovate, to battle in that war or win that war, that's how you like make the world better. Man, that was a really big, big yeah, thought, but that's absolutely. what I had to think about what, and because the, of what you just said. And I, I, I still agree with it. Like I, 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 I find it very intriguing. The rebuttal to that then is I, what I usually get is CJ, if it's going to create energy technology innovation and the, and the overall cost of, and price of energy is going to go down, well, then doesn't that lower the value of Bitcoin? Because then the cost to produce it goes down. If it's but, easier, yeah. But then this is where they have to remember the difficulty adjustment. Because when you get into these hash wars and all this mm. hash rate comes online, well, that's going to force the difficulty to go up. So yeah, the price of energy can continue to go down and provide massive benefits to society. But at the same time, because of the difficulty adjustment, the cost of production per Bitcoin, the natural asset value, is still being protected because of that difficulty adjustment. So yeah, yeah. you can get it's, it's a win-win situation. We so can drive even yeah. So even in a situation where the energy would be free. Let's say we can capture the ether energy in a sense with super, you know, simple copper or whatever, Tesla tower stuff. Let's say something very basic, right? Even when the energy would be free, you still have, well, if there's then more people mining, the difficulty will just go up infinitely, right? Mm -hmm. in, in that sense. Does that, uh, does that make sense? Right? Absolutely. So if, if that cost goes to zero, which it'll never be because you have to organize a space and people and right. you know there's some sort of cost in, right. in you know operational cost in that sense um that's that's your that's the answer to the question is mm. even when the energy is free energy is just one line item yeah, in my exactly. cost i still have yes. to pay my employees i still have to rent the land i still have to pay for my capital there's a whole bunch of different costs that go into this so if just one of those line items goes down to free in the form of energy that doesn't get rid of my other line items. Yeah. So there's always going to be a natural asset value relative to the cost that acts as a floor price for the value yes. proposition. That's the, that's the other thing. What, floor price for what? For the value proposition. Do we need a money that protects us? A money us? backed by something, yes. Right. Do we need a, a digital – do we need commoditized energy in the form of money that allows us to save and store our value through time and space that nobody else can dilute – is that a value probable position? To, of course, that you it is. can transact with anyone in the yeah. world, permissionless, a religious, yeah. all these things. Exactly. All the yeah. benefits of Bitcoin. That's mm -hmm. the value proposition. What is the value proposition worth? Remember, if the marketplace was going to deny Bitcoin and reject Bitcoin, then what you would see it in the form of price because people wouldn't be willing to pay twenty seven thousand. Yes. They'd be saying, "I'm not paying that much because I'm not getting any value for that." Well, today, the marketplace isn't saying that at all, because look at the profitability of miners. They're saying, hey, I need I got you. yeah, what you're, what you're producing. Yeah. So because I need what you're producing and it's solving my problem and the value proposition of yes. your solution to my problem is worth me paying a price that creates profit for you, that's the, that's the free market signaling the acceptance of Bitcoin. If, we, if it went the other way, then the price went below cost, miners would turn off, difficulty yeah, yeah, would yeah. go down. It, you get into that whole thing. But this that's the only place This is a textbook explainer, I'd say. Yeah, that's textbook the- Textbook explainer for, for a product market fit type of situation. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, how are prices, how are prices discovered? That's probably one of the, if you are looking up anything, let's say you've read about Bitcoin, you read the white paper, you've read a couple of books and you're like, all right, I feel like there's nothing else I can learn. Here's something that's a great topic for people to study price discovery. Look up and look into how free market price discovery works. So if you're a business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, how are you deciding what your price is? Answer that question and Bitcoin will start to make a lot more sense, the, at least the price action. The price action of Bitcoin when it's at its commodity value on the bottom half of this S-curve will start to make a lot more sense because you can be defined as a free market price discovery cycle rather than just like volatility, right? Because that's what, that, oh, Bitcoin's so volatile. No, it's going through price discovery. We're trying to discover the value of the underlying proposition, 
the value of the solution to everybody's problem. Yep. And we haven't yep. arrived at that number yet. And we won't until we get to the top of the S curve. And at by that time, it's too late because we won't even keep track in Bitcoin. We'll keep track in Satoshi's. I love that. That's a great point. So we've been talking for one and a half hours, which is great. I, lo I love it. I want to I wanna move on to my last question, which I asked to everyone. What's a core belief that you will never let go? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, and, you know, it's even more embarrassing because you told me it earlier, so I had time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think um, a, a core value that I have that I just can never be explained away or given away is the concept of a true free market. That's, that's really what I think empowers Bitcoin. I think, you know, Bitcoin wins because it's free market. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean everything we just talked about, the, the natural asset value, the, the way that the price discovery works on Bitcoin, the way that interest rates work on Bitcoin, right? Price discovery works on costs and profit. Uh, interest rates work on the supply of money and the demand on loans. Price works on the, de the variables in demand as we go through bull and bear cycles. These free market concepts are what empowers Bitcoin to outcompete uh, anything else that the, the rest of the world has to offer because we're in the position today where the rest of the world has decided we are smarter than the free market. We can figure this out better than the market can figure it out. And I, I could not disagree with that statement more. I don't think any human or team of humans or conglomerate of humans or a conglomerate of central banks, the Bank of International, International Monet, I don't think any of these people uh, can collaborate and figure out what a price should be. I think that free market principles based on supply and demand, not only of the good and service, but of the money and or currency that's being used to buy that good or service, those are the principles that um, are protected by the natural laws of economics and trying to change those laws, trying to state the rate of interest and trying to outsmart the free market is kind of like trying to change the laws of mathematics or change the laws of gravity. You know, like if I take my phone and just throw it up, I can't just say that my phone's not going to fall back down to the yeah. ground. It's heavier <laughs> than the, you know, there's natural laws yeah. of physics that are going to guarantee that this phone comes back down to the ground. You can't change those laws. You can't change the natural laws of economics. And Bitcoin, through its design, strategically leverages those laws to empower we the people. I love it, man. Thanks for sharing. And thanks for coming on. I really enjoyed this. I think we, we went deep and everywhere. So uh, that's nice. Um, yeah, where, where can people find more of your thoughts and writings? And you also have a YouTube channel. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation and I apologize. I can, I can go off in so many different directions. So I appreciate everybody's patience. But if you're interested in hearing more about my thesis of Bitcoin as commoditized energy in the form of money, the reserve asset of the internet economy, and the most pristine form of collateral in the world, then you can just follow me on Twitter at CJ Constantinos. Uh, I did recently launch a YouTube channel. Uh, mainly it just has interviews like this, but hopefully I'll be able to start creating content soon. Uh, so yeah, Twitter and YouTube are the best places to, to follow along. Awesome, man. Thanks again. And uh, let's uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.